All right, uh, thanks to those of you who stayed around. Um, <laughs> before we get started, I wanted to invite everyone to go to the app. Uh, for those of you who downloaded the app, if you haven't, please download the app, the Kanban map, you would have got an email. Um, so on the app, we're going to be asking a question to the audience, um, which I think Kate will be controlling. Um, and uh, that's just to keep you engaged uh, as we go through the uh, discussion. So um, I'm Brandon Searle. I'll be the moderator for the next hour. Um, my role at, uh, at the University of New Brunswick is with the Offsite Construction Research Center. The center started, I guess, officially became a center in uh, May of 2019 after a uh, generous investment. Uh, by Osco Construction Group, uh, announced in September 2018. Um, so my role, I guess, is working on industry engagement. Uh, my colleagues are here, uh, the research chair, Dr. Zen Lei, you might have heard him speak earlier today, um, the operations engineer, Jeremy Bowmaster, and uh, I guess the chair of civil engineering, uh, Dr. Jeff Rankin. So to my left, we have our uh, four distinguished uh, panelists. Um, to begin, uh, I'll get them each to introduce themselves. I'll, I have a sentence on each of them, and then, uh, and then uh, I'll let Hans and Arnold, Jared, and Dirk introduce themselves. So Hans will be, to my left, will be representing uh, kind of the suppliers and subcontractors on an executive level, as well as being a board member for the Offsite Construction Research Center. So Hans, if you'd like to uh, introduce yourself. Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. Um, my name is Hans Klone, and I'm the president of the OSCO Construction Group. And we're based out of St. John. We're, we're a maritime company. And we've been in business since 1955. Um, we operate uh, a total of, of, of 24 different facilities that uh, offer construction related products and services. Um, and we have about 1200 employees. We, we work uh, right across Canada and uh, along the Eastern seaboard of the US. Um, you, you heard from Can-Am this morning, uh, not this morning, but it's getting late, but it's not that late. Mm -hmm. um, and they were talking about structural steel. We, we're a little bit different in that we're kind of diversified in the construction industry. So we, we are, we're in the steel business, we're in the concrete business, and we're in the construction business. And we make uh, structural steel like Can-Am, and we helped actually Can-Am on the Mercedes project. Thank you again for letting us do that. <laughs> and uh, we do reinforcing steel and we do um, precast concrete um, and we do structural and architectural precast concrete. We will make construction aggregates, we do ready mix concrete and we do subcontracting for electrical and mechanical um, and we do construction management and uh, general contracting. Uh, so, we, we're kind of different in that we're a manufacturer and we're very interested in manufacturing and we're also a contractor. So we get to see what it's like to be in a factory and what it's like to be on job sites. So we have kind of an interesting <laughs> perspective and, from, from, and we're into the design. We do a lot of design work. I guess that'll, that'll be enough. <laughs> So he's busy. <laughs> so yeah, uh, to his left is Arnold uh, Wood from the Halifax International Airport. He'll kind of be representing an owner's perspective in the, in the panel discussion, so Arnold. Thank you. I've been with Halifax International since 2000 and seen the transformation of the airport from when it was under Transport Canada's um, governance. So um, when we got the airport, it was, it was behind, it was under capacity and it had to be uh, had built. Uh, and so we've been managing a construction program there ever since. I helped you know, renovate and build and expand. And um, Hans helped with the parking garage and some other work there. So it's really a partnership with the design and the consultant construction because 
we all work together over and over and over again. And as an owner, we want to facilitate that and improve the processes, and that's why BIM is so important. Um, person I'm responsible for our long-term master plan, so that sets up our whole construction program 20 years out. We know what project we're doing every year. It's all based on passenger flow. So as those passenger levels advance, then we turn on projects. We've got the funding there. So, you know, and then we need a construction and design team to uh, help us to expand for the passengers. So that's our key role. Um, I manage all the design. My team manages the, all the design processes and all the construction process. So for all the terminal development, um, it's a, it's, it sounds complicated, but it's pretty straightforward because of the master plan. We know what we're doing. There's minor changes in it, and we redo it every five years just to make sure it's up to date and accurate with new security requirements. So um, we're proud to really you know, be an uh, a economic engine for you know, the Nova Scotia, Halifax area, and, and any of the specialty trades through the Maritimes. Um, so uh, what we want to do is help advance the process, and BIM is a good format because we get a better design, a more efficient construction. Um, the building that we have is built in the, in the 60s, so it's been under constant renovation since that time. So that means our as-built records are kind of sketchy and, and you really can't rely on them. So under the traditional role of how to redesign, rebuild over and over again, we take the product from the last design and construction team as uh, what's now called record documents instead of as-builds, and we give those to the next team, and they give us theirs back. And so what, it, progressively we've seen our change orders just building and building. Oftentimes you can't investigate fully and in an operating environment to find the conditions and drop ceilings and measure stuff in advance. So we had a lot of change orders. So we entered into the BIM field six years ago um, initially to save money and schedule, purely selfishly. And I think that's a lot of what's driving the industry. And we've seen some good successes through that. One project um, was 2% change order. And it was a 3.5 million, not a huge, huge project. But that's good. That's great. Schedule is right on. So we've seen the success of it, so we've expanded that to you know, 20, 30 million dollar projects. And depending on the contracts we let, we've seen some good successes and some lessons learned. Um, so um, we're transforming our model from uh, that 2D environment with CAD to Revit. We've got a skeleton model of the terminal with steel and the envelope. And each design we do, instead of scanning everything and and converting everything to 3D. We're doing it each project as we renovate more strategically um, because we're going to learn some lessons as we go. Um, on the operation side, uh, we're seeing the benefits of facility management with this model, with our baggage system. It was all 3D. You could pull the part numbers off of it. So all that got dumped into Maximo, and we're doing that continuously now. So uh, we don't have this all figured out yet, but we're committed to bin innovation, and that's why we're here. All right, thanks, uh, Arnold. So to his left, we have uh, Jared Smith from CBCL. He uh, has a background in electrical engineering, and he helped implement Revit uh, across their, their business. So uh, Jared, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Sure, so thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for hanging around this late in the afternoon. Um, so yeah, CBCL, we're a multidisciplinary firm, uh, largest employee-owned uh, consulting firm in Atlantic Canada. We have eight offices between uh, um, Ottawa and Newfoundland. Um, full structural, civil, mechanical, electrical, municipal. We, we, anything you need, we got it, except for architecture. So, um, Myself, uh, I lead a team, our electrical buildings team, of about uh, 10 people um, who are, uh, when, when I started, it was uh, primarily it was solely CAD, and we've slowly developed that into more and more Revit projects as we can get our architectural partners on board, providing architectural models that we can base uh, electrical mechanical models off of. Um, structural buildings for us, we're 100% uh, Revit. We don't use CAD anymore at all for structural buildings, so um, doing quite well there. Um, really looking to push more and more uh, BIM and Revit specifically for us, but BIM in general um, with our partners, just we can see the, the benefits as, uh, you know, in, as Arnold alluded to with change order reductions with uh, a number of efficiencies in terms of design and construction implementation. So happy to be here. Thanks.
Sorry, <laughs> we're just uh, getting the right slides up here. Um, so in two, Jared's left, we have Dirk DeWinner. Uh, Dirk has a background uh, kind of as an owner and a bit of manufacturing, but primarily uh, in the general contracting space with Bird. Um, so Dirk, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, again, thanks for uh, sticking around on a late afternoon there. A few of you guys have beer drinks, so. Uh, <laughs> That's the only promise after this uh, this event here, but uh, so Bird's a uh, publicly traded uh, uh, contractor in Canada. We're uh, involved in uh, the institutional, commercial, and uh, industrial work. We uh, were construction manager, we're project managers, we're uh, electrical contractors, mechanical contractors, heavy civil, and actually have a uh, modular have a fifty percent stake in a. Uh, modular plant in China. Um, so we were involved with uh, a lot of design build projects, uh, modified design build, triple P's, um, you name it, we, 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 those types of projects where most of them were involved with. We do do, uh, um, uh, back to me, I'm the SVP for Atlantic Canada and Manitoba, just skip over Ontario, but, uh, <laughs> and we've been around, we'll be, uh, for Bird, we'll be uh, celebrating our 100th year, uh, 100 year uh, in business uh, in 2020. So. Sounds good. Thanks, Dirk. Um, so just the format of the event is going to be, uh, uh, I'm going to ask each, each panelist a question. Uh, we'll then ask the audience to respond um, to a, a question, which we'll see something like this happening. Um, and then uh, it'll be open questions to the to the audience to ask the panelists. So uh, in, in case there's no questions from the audience, I have a few uh, saved here. Um, and then I'll, I'll wrap up uh, my, our portion by with some thank yous uh, to everyone. So um, to get started, uh, I wanted to start with uh, uh, with hands or yep. I forgot there was only one mic. I should have went that way. But so, Hans, uh, you've helped grow uh, Osco Construction Group, uh, being both, uh, I guess, concrete supplier, steel supplier, um, uh, working uh, as a general con uh, contractor. How has your company uh, adopted technology and day-to-day -day practices? Um, and what were the core drivers for adopting these, I guess? Um, and how, in your role as an executive, do you influence this uh, with the with the people using it day to day? It's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, we we view uh, technology as a key differentiator for for our group. Um, strategically, it's very very important. We. We think uh, there's a lot of contractors in, in the construction space. And uh, so we have to look for ways that we can, we can stand out from the crowd and, and technology is certainly one of them. And in fact, we, we do have an IT governance, uh, governance committee that uh, meets uh, twice a year and looks at all the technology that we have in our company and looks to see if it's aligning with what our strategic objectives are and our goals. And uh, our, our, our whole IT infrastructure is kind of at two levels. We have enterprise um, um, IT, uh, which is on two backbones. The first backbone is, is the Oracle J.D. Edwards uh, transactional system that we use um, for really interfacing with our customers, suppliers, our employees, and our facilities. And that's where we record everything that we're doing, um, you know, we're receivables, payables, and all of that sort of thing. And everybody in the company has to learn how to use that because there's one, it doesn't matter which line of business we're talking about, um, we are recording transactions in the same fashion using the same um, layouts and job costing systems and that so that when we look at reports, 
everybody understands what, they, what they're trying to tell us. The other backbone we have is the, uh, call it communication, content, collaboration backbone, which is office, the Office 365 suite. And again, there's a lot of applications that are part of that, and many of you are probably using that as well. But again, everybody is trained to use that across the enterprise. Then when you get to lines of business, we, um, we're very project focused because we're a contractor and a manufacturer, but for, for specific projects. So every line of business has uh, its own applications that are kind of best of breed, we hope, in the industry in which they compete. And uh, every, pretty well every line that we have is into modeling because of the projects. And so we have, we have quite a few different BIM systems that we, we use. We use the Tecla system. We use the SDS and Evencheck uh, product as well. We use Revit. We use Navisworks. Um, we use uh, Bentley MicroStation for rebar. So we have quite a few different uh, BIM um, systems that we're using. And the reason they're different is because depending on the line of business we're in, we want that data to, to be used in that line of business, in the applications for that line of business. For example, estimating, like a bill of materials will come out of, out of the uh, BIM system, and then that bill of materials is used for estimating, it's used for scheduling, uh, it's used for uh, visual or for uh, uh, sequencing work in the plant and, and those types of things shipping, logistics, all of those things. Uh, and we use within that also the BIM system for sharing models with our customers and even with, within ourselves, like if we're doing a, a structural steel with precast on it, then we coordinate between the two uh, businesses to make sure that the connections on the steel match the connections on the precast. It's not a good day when they don't. I've been there, it's not happy. Um, but that's kind of what, we, what we're looking to do. We then take the data further down into the plants, and you, you, you heard Sam talk about that at Can-Am. We do very similar things for structural steel. We also do that for, for concrete. And concrete is a little bit more complex, I guess, than steel in that we're actually batching, like baking a cake, we're batching concrete. And concrete has become quite technical now with the additives and the different types of cements that you can use, the blends of cements, supplementary uh, cementitious materials. So batching of concrete has become quite sophisticated. And we, our batching system and our our mixing system, our batching system, and our delivery system, and our placing system are all automated in, in some of our plants now. Uh, so there's a lot of technology that's, that's being used for that. In addition to that, we're going further into um, using the Internet of Things um, for uh, we, we're experimenting right now with a product called Sigfox. And Sigfox is kind of a low bandwidth, low cost, um, low power network developed for the Internet of Things. It's out of Europe, and they have a worldwide uh, distribution system. They've recently come to Canada, and we're the first user for concrete. And what we're doing with it is we're putting sensors, um, thermocouples into our concrete and, and a sensor outside of the member so we don't, we don't waste the sensor because they're quite expensive. But the idea is that the concrete will, will tell us when it's ready for us to strip it out of the forms, to detention the concrete if it's pre-stressed and when we can take it out of the forms because we want to turn the forms over every day. So what the other thing we're looking at is uh, for a ready mix group, 
whether we can put sensors into cast in place frames and tell customers when their floor finishers can come and start finishing their floors because it's very annoying when floor finishers arrive and they can't get on the concrete and we've all been there, people get upset. So we're playing with those types of things. We're playing with, uh, with our ready mix trucks. We've got uh, GPS networks now so that all our trucks, we can dispatch them and have them arrive at the job sites in sequence. Um, they have geo fences at the, uh, at the plants and at the job sites. And they, as they go through their phases of batching and mixing and washing out the trucks, we can tell where they are and when they're gonna arrive and schedule the batch plant to load them sequentially and also tell our customers exactly when the trucks are gonna arrive. So we don't have to make up stories and get them all upset. At least I don't anyway. <laughs> but those are some of the things that we're working on. And in, an, in the case of why we're doing that, we, the drivers for all of this is, is to uh, eliminate human interaction with data. We really don't want, once data goes in, we want it to go in once and then be transferred to the next application without it being touched again. Because as soon as it's touched again, there's gonna be mistakes, there's gonna be different versions of the truth. And uh, so we wanna avoid that and we wanna avoid paper. Uh, there's just too much paper in the world and, and uh, so that's why we do what we do. It's a long-winded response, and I'm sorry, but no, it's perfect. That's where we are. We started 15 minutes I early, know. so it was. Planned. I'm even putting myself to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it, no, no, yeah, you can turn it over to Arnold. But thank you, Hans. It was kind of unique because a lot of the presentations we've seen so far are more focused on the project-to-project -project work, and. And Hans is coming out at a view from the whole corporation and, and all the technologies involved in that rather than just project delivery. So it's, it's kind of neat to see. Um, Arnold, so uh, uh, being, representing the owner, um, and I know you've, you've had some, some good stories, like you just mentioned, the 2% change orders, but there's also the horror stories. Um, so how do you think, or how has the airport helped influence or guide technology and construction? What would you recommend to, uh, to the designers, contractors, and trades, and, and different players in the, sub, in the supply chain um, who are starting to use these new technologies or looking to implement it and f for, from an owner's perspective? Okay. So the first question was on influencing technology. Well, and I'll stick with BIM because... Um, Hans carried, covered everything else. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, a few years ago, we started with the, the 3D design just to get the conflict resolution done proper before they come to site. And so for our design contracts, we specify it in the contracts that they have to use BIM, BIM 360, Revit, Field, Glue, um, Docs, so that they have to do that before they show up so that we, we bought that service. We don't want to jam them up and do something that they're not traditionally using. So when we first started doing that, talking about your second question about procuring services, the people that we traditionally used disappeared from the bidding because they were you know, old school design firms. This was five, six years ago. Um, so we seen this new group of companies come up, design firms, that actually you know, all their people at a school had Revit. So, oh, you want Revit? Okay, great. Love to work on a Revit project. Now these are small projects. Mm -hmm. um, when we go out for large projects, we get response from the national companies that have the the Revit experience, and they just got to bring them in, or you know, have conference calls and meetings on smart screens with them, calling in from another location. So, um, so that's what we started doing, uh, and then we've developed that. We've made some lessons learned on some projects. Um, what we've also done a few, couple years ago is we have a project smart room where we have a smart screen, audiovisual equipment for conference calls because of people not being on site. And so we can host the model on site. Um, and our goal that we're developing is um, to have the job meetings there with the trades. Um, these, we had some excellent presentation this morning uh, and this afternoon on, on 
different companies using this. And in the Halifax area, there's only a few companies that have that capability down to the trade level. So we want to host um, that capability on site. We've also hosted training uh, with Autodesk coming in so that people in the field, the people on the, even on the cons local consulting teams can come up and can use the product that we're specifying. And we've trained our own staff and all our staff have tablets can walk around and view the project in 3D much like we've seen in some presentations this morning. Um, we're, uh, so we're also a landlord, so our tenants are airports and international food and beverage providers, and retail concessionaires. Um, so you know, we asked them to do Revit and they go, okay. So we were surprised that there was no pushback, but they have the um, capability with the international firms to just do it. And it's, it's prevalent in a lot of the world, so we were surprised that we got that so easily. Um, and by specifying this requirement, it, it also helps the local firms because uh, they know that it's viable. They can buy the technology and they can use it instead of who's going to buy this off me. Unless an owner is requiring it, then it's up to the construction industry to use it just for its own selfish purposes. Um, and if that is contracted in, the owner can benefit too. Um, so your second question was on recommendation designers and construction trades. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen some good presentations today, so industry re leaders, um, and we've seen those projects examples, and those are usually big mega projects. So we need something scalable for all the small projects so that the, uh, the small trades um, and you know the mechanical electrical contractors uh, right across the board can participate. Um, and, and unless the trades have a financial initiative to do that, I see an owner and a consultant actually hosting some of those on their behalf. And for what we're doing, hosting a smart room is a job room on site because we have 20 trades in at a time. And there's any time there's like six to 10 construction projects going on of varying sizes. So by helping host that, then the exposure can be there. And so the success stories of Construction companies, design, design firms, is based on people. It's not necessarily the company because the company can give you their credentials, but it's the team you get. Unless that team has the skills, then your product, project, you know, we've had some experimental projects that didn't go as well as others, and it was ultimately up to the people. Um, because we're an airport, we have to we need the expertise of the national firms for design because there's airport planning, runways, air, you know, specific construction elements that aren't with the local experience, unfortunately. But recently, a lot of the international and national design firms have sort of gobbled up all the local firms anyway. So again, it's to train them. That training should be national. And so it help the national firms train up their local people. And if we can partner with that, by contracting it, hosting uh, ability for the subtrades to actually engage. That's one way we see forward. So we want to partner so that we can help move it along. Because we've seen the success mm -hmm. and we're hungry for everybody to be involved. Because the owner usually pays yeah. at the end of the day. <laughs> um, and everybody else is in business to stay in business and make money. So we want everybody to make money. Because otherwise, you know, your price is going to go up for us next time. And we want low prices, um, reasonable prices, industry prices, based on working at a, a complicated site. And so the only way to do that is through this BIM strategy, you know, having the phasing done in design, everything sort of laid out so that everybody can come and do their work efficiently. And, and then the construction team leaves as soon as possible because uh, this isn't a greenfield build with a store to open later. Um, we need our runways back, we need our bridges back, we need our hold rooms back. Mm -hmm. So we see this as facilitating that. And it, again, it's the people, the training, and the experience they have from continuous improvement in the, in using Revit, BIM, and these other tools. So um, we were talking earlier about uh, integrated project delivery, IPD, um, and talking to how you were interested as an owner to help uh, local industry um, gain that knowledge by working with the larger companies. Are you, f first, first question, I guess, is, uh, are you using 
looking to use IPD or is that a way of the future? And if, if it is, um, is that, do only the large corporations have that ability to, to get involved early on? Um, and are you in the contracts or in the procurement, are you mandating if a large company from maybe outside of Canada or out west or someone that's not uh, traditionally in Atlanta, Canada, are they required to use some local people or, or is there a way to, as an owner, for you to influence that knowledge transfer to the local industry? That's happening naturally. Um, we don't say you have to be a national firm. We don't say you have to be a local firm. We let the industry decide and we try to make it so that people can set up a, you know, a joint venture. We've had that before where we've had a local uh, design firm lead and, and, and they bought the design, the airport designing um, from another team. Uh, we've had, and then I, I talked about the national firms buying up the local design firms. Because of that, we get the local people anyway. And frankly, we prefer the local people because if you need someone to come check on something in the job, well, I'll see if I can get a flight out there next week. That mm -hmm. doesn't cut it, right? Because, you know, we've got a construction problem right now. So we prefer, and, and, and we've been getting local firms, and it's usually it's the airport planners and designers from these larger firms, either through a consortium or from, like, the larger national design firms. So we get it anyway. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right, I'll um, I'll hand it over to, to Jared quick. So, Jared, you were uh, you've helped implement uh, Revit and, and new technologies across uh, uh, the organization, uh, CBCL. Um, when I've uh, engaged with industry, I know a lot of uh, designers and consultants are looking to build specs for using Revit internally and moving away from AutoCAD. So, one question or I guess a couple questions. Um, how, how would you recommend doing this to people who are just starting? I know there's some people in the audience that are local to New Brunswick um, and have maybe purchased Revit and it's sitting on the shelf for two years and they haven't used it yet. So what would you recommend? And do you, actually, what would you recommend? Let's, let's start with that. Sure, so speaking from, from our experience, electrically at least, what worked, we found worked well. Um, you know, first we started off by opening Revit and going, oh my God, what am I doing? Um, followed quickly by, you know, we, we organized an approach. So for us, it, it started with the template. So getting our, our firm's CAD standards, line weights, your, um, you know, the typical common items, title blocks, things that you use on all that, and use that as your basis for new uh, projects moving forward. Um, you really have to treat that as a living document in our experience because you'll continue to add families and uh, more common things as you work on different projects in different sectors. You know, industrial, you're going to have a whole different set than buildings or uh, institutional versus others. Um, we found that too many cooks in the kitchen wasn't great either. So you need one sort of disciplined champion in our experience to really run and, and manage that template and keep it consistent and accurate and not bloated, essentially. Um, and you're going to build your library of families over time. Not every family should be stored in this template, for example. So your decorative lighting fixtures, for example, that work great in your retail store, they're, they're not going to be in the next office build. So keep them separate in your library, but don't over bloat your um, software to begin with. Um, we realized it's important to organize that, that template again by you know, reversion for us specifically it was Revit, so Revit version uh, by discipline, then metric and imperial all have different implications in there. So keeping everything um, so, uh, sorted correctly. And just in general, be cautious of downloading families from manufacturers. Um, they require oftentimes a lot of cleaning, vetting. There's a lot of things in there proprietary that you don't necessarily want. So, so have a, that's sort of the general baby first steps into to getting your, your quality. Because at the end of the day, the deliverables for us still are the 2D drawings that Revit generates. So it's important to us that they look good and that they, you know, if you set them next to a CAD drawing, you can't necessarily tell which one was done in Revit and which one was done in CAD. Um, yeah, and building on that, uh, so you're relatively young and took on this responsibility across the, the organization. Um, do you, can you speak to the decision behind uh, giving you that responsibility and um, some of maybe the difficulties that you had with 
people who are like, oh no, we've done this with it this way for 40 years. We're not going to change. Don't, if it's not broke, don't fix it. How did you uh, work with that to change people's mindsets? Sure. So for me personally, I, uh, I started with Revit completely selfishly. So both my parents, federal government employees, lots of job security there. Private sector, you, you make your own job security. So we, uh, this is the skill that I wanted to have. Um, we weren't doing it and other, other engineers in electrical at the time were not taking it on. Um, I was young and ambitious and I went for it. So we still absolutely have people who, who won't, who, you know, we've been designing in CAD this way for since the dawn of time. Mm -hmm. And this is the way I like it. This is the way it's going to stay. And that's fine because there's still that, that mass corner of the, of the market that still, you know, architecture still using CAD on projects. So it's not like they're getting completely left behind. Um, but uh, lately, we've had a lot more uptake with our technologists and engineers, even our, our senior guys who've been there 35, 40 years. They're starting to get into Revit and, and BIM in general. So um, it's a slow sort of grassroots um, movement at the beginning, and it's sort of take hold. So it was never mandated. It was suggested that we learn Revit. Um, it was never mandated, but uh, a couple ground level grassroots uh, folks picked it up and we're running with it now. Thanks. Um, so moving over to uh, Dirk. Um, so Dirk, I have a couple notes here. So I know uh, Bird had purchased a 50% stake in Stack, which you, you mentioned earlier. Um, and that, that was kind of demonstrating a willingness to, to take a risk on a new product. And I'm sure Xavier would be happy to, uh, to have heard that. So do you have recommendations for senior leaders at, uh, at the, at, in similar positions to yourself who are uh, looking to or might be hesitant to uh, adopt a new process or adopt a new technology? Um, and what would you recommend to, to those people that are in a similar position to yourself? Yeah, so we, we looked at the uh, stack uh, as something that was uh, the modular side of it. That uh, So stack is, for, for the record, it's a, it's a modular steel frame um, units that are manufactured in China. Mm -hmm. And uh, we sell primarily to North America, primarily to the West Coast, but recently just did a project in, uh, a successfully completed project in Iqaluit. So what we looked at that is, we, we, Bird used to have the mindset is that we didn't want to be an early adopter. You know, maybe uh, let, the, let some of the, t let the early adopters uh, take on the, the pain of, 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 of these new technologies and going from there. But that mind shift is changing internally. And uh, we're looking to jump on these new technologies as strategically. We think it's, a, it's important that we be, uh, look at the, uh, the advantages of these products and, and, and what advantages that can bring to the company in, in itself. So, so if you're a company that's going to sit on the fence there, and I, we see the technology changing fast now. Like uh, the, probably construction is one of the last adopters. Of, uh, there's been no big uh, Ubers, Ubers in our business at all. So that's about to change, I think, with all this new new technology and technology, and it's getting quicker and faster and better. So if, if you're not going to jump on, I think you're going to get left behind. And sometimes when you get left behind, it's hard to catch that caboose. So <laughs> if you don't get get on it and get going. So most of you guys in this room are, you wouldn't be here if you weren't a, an early adopter and have that mindset. But I'd uh, suggest going back to your offices and, and promoting that and uh, finding these new technologies because, you know, we get owners that uh, like the Halifax airport, uh, and I know you and me are big fans of supporting for technology changes. And if we don't find ways to make yourself more efficient in product, uh, uh, ways for we can improve cost for our owners, and uh, uh, like the Ellis Don, uh, Ellis Don proposal or uh, presentation, they may just go right by us. So they, you know, they'll find another way to get to the solution done. So, yeah. So, um, and when, since uh, purchasing, uh, uh, stack or acquiring or becoming a partner with Stack, how has the how does the decision get made about going from uh, traditional construction to modular? <laughs> like internally, what 
what decisions were made to go modular in Iqaluit? I'm guessing, given the location was a big reason, but what's the new process internally for that? Well, we actually secured that project, um, and it was going to be a traditional build, and we took a uh, harder look at it and, and convinced the owner that, you know, uh, the advantages of uh, doing that, uh, I think it's a 98-room hotel in Iqaluit, is that originally it was going to be a three-year schedule. Um, the cost, the cost uh, differences were neg negligible for the direct cost. Um, I think actually stack was uh, a little more expensive. Um, and the uh, the, the um, shipping cost from Shanghai to China was huge. If you mm -hmm. can think about it, if you're going through the Pacific, through Panel Canal, up up through the Atlantic, and then uh, there's only a short window you can get in um, in a Callaway. But saying that, um, we went back to the owner and said, we think we can save you a year on your construction schedule, which was very interesting to them. We, we, we have a better, uh, we secured the project as a construction manager. We have a better uh, chance in uh, predicting our costs better, which they were all for that. So it was pretty, win uh, and obviously the savings of Quality, uh, quality improvements in a, in, a, in a manufacturing center versus a on site, and the cost of the unpredictable labor f uh, force in uh, in a Callaway itself. So those are a lot of the things that went into it. Uh, internally, I would suspect they would have had some their bridge financing would have been a lot cheaper, and they uh, they get to celebrate a uh, hotel that's going to be a year earlier for them. I'm assuming so. For sure, it was a pr pretty easy decision for the owner after they vet vetted that out. They, but they did do their diligence. They visited the uh, manufacturing plant in chi China and, and uh, reviewed the whole processes and what have you. So, nice. yeah, and I guess uh, the quicker they're open, the quicker they're collecting revenue. So, um, so we had opened up the app, and I see. I'm guessing most people responded, and uh, I think through a lot of the questions, it was pretty obvious what what the biggest. Uh, barrier, I guess, in Atlantic Canada is to uh, overcoming uh, or must overcome in order to digitize the built environment. So 53% uh, said social and human behavior. And I read a, um, a report in 2015 that was done through Concordia University. Uh, they had a similar uh, session to this where uh, culture was identified as the biggest barrier to innovation uh, in construction. Um, I'm not going to target anyone in particular to answer the question, but in, in your opinion, uh, who's who in the project is most responsible for pushing innovation in construction? So, for example, uh, I know in the UK, the BIM mandate came out and all federal projects must be to a certain LOD. Um, and I don't know how successful that's been, but um, it's kind of been mandated, I guess, by government, by federal government. Uh, in Canada, we don't have that yet. It seems like private industry is kind of pushing it. Um, whose role, in your opinion, whoever wants to answer this first, um, uh, would it be to, to kind of push this forward? I guess uh, no one else picking up the mic, so <laughs> <laughs> those beer tickets must be going really <laughs> burning everyone's pockets here. Um, for us, we've seen uh, it, it actually on all, all sides. We've seen uh, we got a, a group in our Calgary in our Calgary offices that have been early adopters to technologies, and, and they're really pushing the the BIM models and, and class detection through Navis Works, and really getting out in front of that. And that's that, that's been. Fabulous. You, we've seen a lot of clients uh, try to mandate that as well, and that, that, that's worked, but I don't see it. Uh, I think they're, sometimes they're pushing rope with respect to that unless they get the right partners and the right subcontractors. So we've seen it on both sides, and, and I think you'll continue to see it on both sides. But um, um, I guess uh, if there's enough uh, energy or mass or momentum going on that, I think you'll see it on both sides. And, start to see it adopt a lot further. Yeah. I'm going to quickly just add to that. I would love to see from a design perspective, I'd love to see every owner mandated. 
because then you're going to drive innovation, I think, a little bit more. Um, it's going to even the playing field when, when firms are responding to the RFPs. Um, just a little bit more. It's, it's really would help drive the industry, in, in my opinion. And for any owner, you'd never want to specify anything that isn't common in the industry, even if it's, if it's new. So I think we're at a point now where if we specify it and we're going to get competitive prices, like a colleague said to me, he said, Revit is going to cost more. And I said, well, I don't think it will. And so on our tender contracts, uh, sorry, on our design contracts, we tendered it and it came in the same. Uh, because you're either getting a, a different firm or a firm that's got the people, again, the people with the skills to deliver it uh, and the training. So I think we're at the cusp of that so that it should be common. And if we had have started specifying this 10 years ago, it wouldn't have wouldn't got any bids and it would have been expensive and wouldn't have saved the same money. But now we're at that point. So mm -hmm. we're happy to participate in specifying something that is beneficial. Um, you know, it does divide the herd on who can bid and not. Um, and that's, and especially in Atlanta can, if you try and force the trades to actually participate in model development, um, I'm not sure if we're there yet. So it's based on where you are and how you put the contract together, um, based on the people and skill set that you have. So you know, we're, and other owners, I think, are happy to specify the work, but it has to actually be competitive and the people to be there to do the work. I only have one comment. Um, whenever the government gets involved, and I just point to cannabis in New Brunswick, <laughs> <laughs> and I won't say anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Hans. I knew you'd come through in the clutch. Um, <laughs> I think you woke up everyone you put to sleep, so that's good. <laughs> no. um, so, uh, yeah, uh, when I was uh, doing some rounds, uh, talking to some of the associations, um, specifically uh, in Nova Scotia, actually, um, I spoke to the, I guess, director or president there, and he said that one fear he has and one fear uh, for his members is that um, he's, he's worried that the large corporations will come in to Atlanta, Canada and wipe out the small players. And, uh, and he wants to drive uh, local industry. Um, he sit, looked at us as a university or educational institution uh, to maybe help build a roadmap to, to ensure that uh, they, they stay, the um, companies are able to stay with the, the rest of the market. Um, so do you, do you see this uh, uh, as an offer, or do you see a need for this for, for the local industry? And, and I don't know if, if uh, this, is, this is the best crowd to answer, but could the associations in terms of CAMB, uh, CANs, um, even uh, government or, or other groups um, help support local industry to ensure that the big players aren't coming in and wiping them out, I guess? Well, I, I, from our, our experience is that um, we want, we will help the smaller contractors who, who we value and have worked with in the past to make the transition. We're, we're actually talking about having sessions or grouping together a group of the larger contractors to invite smaller contractors to come and participate and so that they can come with us. And from my perspective, if, if, they, if they become more digitized, um, that opens doors for them to, uh, again, differentiate themselves from, from their competitors in, in whatever specialty they're in. And so I think the government can play a role to, to help fund the training and, and do things to facilitate that transition. But again, stay out of it. Just give us the money. Give us our tax money back and let us do something with it instead of wasting it um, on other things. Uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't go on. Um, but we are having a bad time of it in New Brunswick here. 
Um, the and and the trade is the we call it the trade associations. I think can do some help in training as well and facilitating uh, for their memberships to you know hold sessions like this to uh, allow them to grow and and uh, convince them that uh, making that transition is worthwhile. So I I don't I don't think that uh, even the large contractors would want to lose all the talent that's out there because a lot of the smaller contractors are very competitive and good at what they do. So I, I wouldn't think that people would want to see them disappear. <laughs> Jeez, you're forcing me to answer questions now. Talking about cannabis, putting people to sleep. It's <laughs> getting unruly up here. Um, yeah, I see the trade, the, the trades, the trades, and the, uh, the building associations uh, playing a big, big part in, in adopting. Like we had uh, other techno, other things that have uh, our industry has adopted and kind of mandated to the safety and our safety uh, associations and the accreditations you need to to bid on government work. Now it's it's it's. There was the same type, same type of comments. What do we do with uh, with our smaller guys? Are they going to adopt it? Well, you know, you're going to have to learn you know, with the support with the, those associations and other other contractors. I think they, they'll get there. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not, you know, the the entrepreneurship of some of those smaller contractors. They'll they'll figure it out. I'm not. I don't think the industry needs to stay and wait and hold. I think we've been doing that for 200 years now, so I think we need to move on, and those guys will jump on board, and they'll get smart about it. And there's ways for uh, for them to figure this out. But um, and uh, the more mass and energy around that, I think it's going to be easier for them to follow. So I don't think we want to wait just because. And, and the industry's not going to uh, leave these guys behind. They'll, they'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been a small general contractor and a, and a large general contractor, and some of the smaller guys are just as quick and, and, and they can adapt quicker than a lot of the bigger guys can, right? So mm -hmm. that's the way I look at it. Thanks. Um, so at this point, I'm going to open the floor up for questions. Yep. Uh, do we have a microphone? Oh. <laughs> I could have done that. Uh, so I'll start by saying that um, I understand that there's a lot of moving parts in this BIM process and there's no one tool or aspect that can function on its own without the rest of the process involved. But that being said, in your opinion, what is the one aspect or one tool of this whole BIM process that you can identify as the quote unquote most important and why? Do you want to ask someone in particular or maybe I'll... All four. Let's start with uh, Jared. <laughs> sure. So the one BIM tool, from our perspective, that's the most important is the the modeling software Revit for us. That would be, you know, that's where we're, we're basing our designs. That's our re replacement for AutoCAD. That's sort of where we start. There's lots of other bits and pieces that go onto that 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 make it all work a little smoother together. But it it starts with with Revit for us. And for an owner is, especially on a building that's getting renovated again, is a clash coordinated 3D design. So that means Revit. So whether you tender it afterwards with 2D drawings or no one brings the toys to the game on the site, you've already gained a lot. If it's all there and done right, then there's the efficiencies of construction. But for the owner, the money's, most of the money's already saved. <laughs> um, but when you say tool, are you talking about software tool, or are you are you talking about what? Mainly in software tools, like, like we're using Revit as an example. Well, Autodesk in North America are the leaders for sure. Um, in Europe, ne Nemechek is probably with Graphisoft is probably very popular, but in North America. Um, you know, for in the building world, I would say Autodesk is the leader, and Bentley probably more in in civil heavy civil work. So, all the 
all the uh, models that we're working with in in our area in our specialty area we we have to be able to go upstream and talk to Revit and through Navisworks. So I, I suppose Navisworks is in terms of coordinating um, construction and design, that's, that's probably pretty important too. Mm -hmm. Because really that's where that interfacing, that's really the big challenge is the, the interfacing between building it, you know, designing it and then getting it built and we, I think the sessions we all went to, you know, there was, there's level 300 and level 400. And it's, I think some people are saying, well, let's go to level 350. I mean, so <laughs> I'm not sure what that means, <laughs> but it's, it's, um, it's, you, you know, maybe Navis works is, is important as well. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll answer it a little differently. This uh, just from uh, an owner and maybe a general contractor's perspective. Um, really, if you peel back the onion, the, the biggest issue we have on our job sites is that if there's a, if there's a, a coordination that that's not done or delays to the project, no owner wants to pay for those indirect costs that that happen. So we need something that's going to see those errors or complications early in the game and be able to deal with them and uh, so you know all those softwares that you guys echoed are, are recommended but you know the the owners are not doing myself any favors either but you know just fundamentally our designers are not given the proper time really to design these things and and then we, you know and, and able to coordinate them properly enough there before we say we want to start so you know those tools help 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 us identify those uh, potential conflicts and, and uh, really as a contractor, that's when you, you get uh, horrendous cost building up when you're, that design's not ready to go. And uh, so if you could find some tools that would be able to speed the design up and then identify those conflicts, it would be, uh, those are big wins for, for everyone from the subcontractors to the owner. And I know you're not looking for my answer, but one thing that came out today <laughs> was that you can't find a, a tool or find a, a tool that meets your current process, not don't change your process to meet the tool. So whatever you go with, make sure it's it meets and fits in your organization, I guess, is one thing that a takeaway that I had just from the presentation today. Um, it's a question right here. Yeah, I have a question and comment on the previous qu uh, question, actually. So it's not important to have the right software tool. It's more important to have the concept itself. So whatever software you are using, at the end of the day, you need to have a proper model so that you can allow any other application of BIM. So clash detection, for instance, is one of the deliverables or one of the applications of the model. So it's not the software. It's the right model. The, the paramount is to have a right model, not the software itself. So this is just a quick comment. And uh, for the airport, so are you using, are you mandating BIM only for the design process, not for the construction? I, I concluded this from your. We started that way because of my previous comment about if, if the design is right and it works on the, on the model and the clash detection is done, then you're going to, because we scan first so that we know we have a point cloud and then they develop a model and layer that on the design. So uh, if we can do that, we can uh, save money. But uh, after that, I think I was at a bird site on that Kia build and seen their, their job trailer where they had the screens up and the big server and they were hosting the model and the trades were all sitting around the table and they were running a job meeting based on the 3D model like we've seen on the other presentations today. That was a few years ago. And that's what inspired us to go to the next step for you know constructability using the tools so that you don't you know build it in 3d and then the trades go up with the six the eight foot ladder and it's the first pipe goes at eight foot two yeah and then everybody else gets their turn so that's what we tr where we went and followed that model by hosting the tools on site so the all the trades can participate in, in building it the way it was designed 
because the first few jobs we did in 3D, well, the, you know, the 3D design got you know, put in the corner and they just did what they usually did. And then if you told them to move it, they had their hand out and say, sure. Right. Um, and innocently so, I guess. So unless you take the design into the construction field, you don't benefit entirely from having a conflict-free design at the start of construction. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you need a model to, for facility management. So you had to scan the existing buildings because you didn't have a model at that point. But if you are building in, in a model <coughs> environment, then it, I think it's beneficial to have this design model going into construction then at the end of the day into the <coughs> facility management system. Yeah, I think you have already my facility management system. It is, that. but we don't have it integrated with, you know, it'd be nice if you had a perfect 3D copy of yeah. your building. And, you know, there's a cost associated with maintaining that. Um, and uh, what's the right, you know, what's the right LOD? Is it 400 with, you know, and if it is 400 for everything and you got the doorknob on there, um, and, you know, you, you can pull it off of the shelf in the stores downstairs and have another one there and track how many they break and have a supply there. We don't do that. Um, but if we did, every time you change a knob, you'd have to, you need a crew to maintain that record. So it's about each organization finding, you know, the right fit for how much you take out of the model and put into facilities management. But if you have the big bucket of data, I'll call it, then facilities management can pull out what they need. If they're only maintaining HVAC systems and fans and boarding bridges and baggage systems, and that's you know that's the most of their work. Then if they track that, they get a big bang for their buck. And to staff up maintaining all these systems, um, we're not there yet, but um, it's an interesting journey. Yeah, this takes me to the next question. Sorry for that. <laughs> it's okay. So. Uh, have you specified uh, BIM specifications on, on your project? So have you specified what needs to be modeled, for instance? Yeah, we, so basically um, it was an aggressive 350 for construction documents. So you really can't get to 350 on all trades and then 400 on as-built. Mm -hmm. um, so, and those projects are still closing out. And so basically what, what we're, our goal is to have what we need for the next project. So when we hand this model to the next design firm, we want to have it accurate enough so that, we, again, we don't get the change orders. So then when they add the design onto the previous model, then there's no conflicts. Um, I'd like to say no change orders, maybe some negative change orders. That'd be nice. <laughs> but that's our, our goal, just to try to continue to develop it better. Thank you. Because we have a renovation building. OK, we might have time for one more question and then have to do a quick wrap up. Um, my question is uh, for anybody that wants to answer it, I guess. Um, do any of you think that uh, the traditional low, low bid procurement process is delaying like, the widespread rollout of, uh, of BIM as like an industry standard in design and construction? And if you do, then uh, what would you think would be a better way? <laughs> Without question. Um, We've, uh, in, the, in the States, we've done quite a number of jobs that are um, IPD, integrated project delivery jobs. Um, and when you first go into them, you're, the, I don't know how many of you, are you, of you are familiar with IPD jobs, but you basically, um, all the parties, um, including the consultant, uh, they they pool their profits. They all get paid their costs, but they pool their profits until the end of the job. And so um, everybody is helping everybody uh, to uh, to be successful. Um, and when we first uh, were invited to do this, we were quite reluctant. And the other thing you have to do is, um, as, as an owner, if you want to go down that road, is you have to uh, get a third party to validate your costs. So 
Uh, that was the first thing we were concerned about is, well, we don't really want to tell you what our costs are. Um, so how does that work? And the answer was, well, we're going to go to Deloitte and you're going to tell Deloitte uh, what your overheads are and your rates and what you, your material costs and all of those things. And they will verify that um, and then they'll certify that your costs are truly your costs. So then as an owner, you know that you're really only paying costs. So we went through that and uh, it, it was, the, the, the atmosphere is completely different. It's not combative. You all sign the same document. Um, so there's no, the indemnities, you've waived all your rights to sue everybody unless you steal or you, you know, do something really crazy. But, but all, the, all the risk is shared on the job. And uh, so it was really quite remarkable um, the amount of input that people were giving. Uh, and you, you know you're going to get the job, so you have to devote all your resources, your, your best people, uh, which you hate to do when you go in and value engineer for somebody and he says, gee, thanks very much. And next week it's in the, ne in the next bit of documents, all the value engineering that you offer to the client is now back out in the market for everybody else to bid to. So why would you do that? So what happens, it's a cat and mouse game to try to get the work without revealing too much of how you're gonna do the job. And, and of course that you know, leads to a whole series of issues. And so I think the IPD is, is certainly a model that uh, we've done. This will be the fifth one that we've done. And uh, again, as long as the team members who have to be vetted, there was, I think, Xavier, or I think it was the, the other individual, sorry, that was talking about uh, pre-qualifying contractors. You have to pre-qualify them for tech, their tech, you know, tech, technical prowess. And if you do, and you invite them to the job, uh, once you build that team, and this was for a university, they wanted to keep the team. So we got five jobs in a row. We didn't bid, we didn't do anything. And we were, as long as the jobs were successful, um, we, you know, we did well. So absolutely, that's a, a big problem. Contracts are a big problem. They, they really are, they're, they're terrible. Um, well, I say they're terrible because they, they, they make it, they, your, your adversaries, you're trying to protect yourself and you, we shouldn't be doing that. We should be helping each other and we're not. So that's a long-winded answer to that question. <laughs> For, uh, you're gonna wanna keep the mic hands. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so we're down to I'm a couple. not a good singer, but <laughs> <laughs> I've heard otherwise. Um, so we're down to a couple, uh, couple minutes and I wanna do a, a quick plug for uh, for the UMB Center, uh, OSCO and CAMBIM. So, um, uh, Hans's uh, company, Osco Construction Group, made a significant investment in uh, UMB to create the Offsite Construction Research Center. And uh, I just wanted Hans to quickly talk about the rationale behind that investment, why he thinks that construction's on the brink of major change, uh, how can Atlantic Canada remain competitive, and why it's important to invest in, in research and development whether at UMB or internally at, at your own organization? Well, I'm a UMB graduate, first of all. So I have a strong connection to UMB, but 25% of our workforce are UMB graduates, salaried workforce are from UMB. And of our engineers, 75%, we have about 50 engineers in our group and 75% are from UMB, which doesn't mean have to be from UMB, but there's a big connection for our company to UMB. But more importantly, 
we're a maritime company and we're very interested in this part of the world and we want to stay here. We, 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 this is our headquarters and this is where we want to remain. And uh, we're, we would really like to see more growth, particularly in manufacturing. And so as a specialty contractor and a manufacturer, um, we, you know, we're in the construction industry and, and when, we, when we looked at what we could do with UNB, um, what it was gonna be something with construction. And when you looked across Canada, there's people that are doing things related to manufacturing and construction you know, Concordia and University of Alberta, Waterloo's doing things, U of T's doing things. But um, with the trends, and we've all heard the trends about BIM and uh, digitization technologies coming and how the construction industry is the last industry left. It's a massive industry and governments are very interested in, in getting more for their money. And if, if you could become 10% more productive and you're spending $200 billion, that's a lot of money you can put back into, into the economy f and get, get more for, for the money you've put in. So when you look at all that, um, we, we were looking at uh, UMB as, as a way to maybe bring together and become a leader in, um, in promoting um, off-site construction and doing research in that. And uh, at the same time, it would maybe be a catalyst for local industry um, and, and uh, consultants to uh, you know, create a niche in, in, that, uh, in that space. Because uh, if you're gonna manufacture components in a factory, why not do it here? Why, why can't we do it here? And so if we, if we put our heads together, we've got a lot of talent here in, in Atlanta, Canada. We've got uh, people that, that are good with their hands and they're good with their minds. And so for us, that's, that's really what we wanted to try to do. And it's not our initiative. It's it's we were we wanted to be a catalyst, but not uh, we weren't doing it for us. We wanted to do it and bring everybody that wanted to be part of it uh, to join in doing it. And hopefully, we can make this the center for Canada and change you know change the industry by continually having something like Canbim. I mean, Canbim is doing I think a great job on the front end of this, on, on the whole digitization and the BIM um, initiatives that, that, are, uh, that you're here today to talk about. So uh, we hope that uh, just by bringing together everybody's thoughts and, uh, and the great research at, the, at UMB that we can do that. And they've demonstrated that with the clusters they've got now for innovation and research in smart grid and uh, marine additive manufacturing. So, so that was really why we kind of did it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, that was just uh, a little plug that I wanted to throw in there. But uh, um, so I guess I wanted to thank the, the panelists. Uh, everyone give them a round of applause, please. <laughs> <laughs>